Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. I'm really excited to tell you about the urine chip, which allows you to do urinary tract infection diagnosis in less than seven months. Some would say the timing of this is inconvenient. I think it's very religious. We've seen a lot of um, the background material, and I would like to show you how this is really a big need, judging by how there's a different company trying to do this. But I also want to show you what's unique about our solution here. So, urinary tract infections are very serious, but in infants, they're hidden. Because kids can't really tell you where their pain is coming from. They have non specific symptoms like fever, irritability, nausea. As a result, in a doctor's office visit, more than half of kids with UTIs will have misdiagnosis. And that comes back in emergency room visits. What happens then? Serious long term consequences. We have recurring infections throughout their lifetime, and then we can have end stage kidney disease for an infant. That leads to something like over $520 million in hospitalization costs every year just in the U.S. And this happens everywhere, across countries too. So this means urinalysis is a large market. To be specific to UTI, it's about 25% of the overall urinalysis market, so it's about $350 million yearly, but it's projected to grow year over year at about 7%. Now, what is the competition? So you've heard a little bit about this already. Culture is the gold standard. Doctors, in fact, if you look at the American Pediatric Association recommendations, they'll ask for a culture test. Because you're going to give an infant a broad spectrum antibiotic that can wipe out their gut microbiome, you need to know that they really have an infection. So doctors will often wait two days before they prescribe something. That's not really acceptable for a child that's sick. You can do a rapid dipstick test, which exists, but these will look at nitrites and metabolites. And often those are not very specific to the kind of bacteria that you're interested in. And they don't often tell you which strain or which pathogen you're looking at. Is it E. coli? Is it Klebsiella? So our solution is an autonomous microchip for rapid easy screening. So during my PhD while working at McGill University under Professor David Younger, I developed a capillary microfluidic chip. And the novelty of our chip was that we started working with 3D printed molds that allowed us to have different um, microchannel sizes. And what this allows us to do is we can make capillary valves where you don't need to have any external pumps or valves to move your liquids around. This allows us to do fast assays with relatively large sample volumes. We can do pathogen-specific assays by having microbes that are functionalized to capture the bacterial interest. And finally, it's very user-friendly. And I'll demonstrate this with this video here. So what's going on in the background is we're showing food dye solutions to illustrate the assay. The yellow food dye would be your urine. So it's a larger sample because it only detect as little bacteria as possible. It's autonomously delivered through your channels once you've started your assay. There's a pack lead column upstream. Oh, there's a laser here somewhere. There's a lead column upstream that your bacteria flows through. Your antibodies flow through after autonomously. And finally, for a proof of concept, we use a fluorophore that gets passed through. So basically, we do a sandwich amino assay targeting all bacterial cells with minimal user intervention. All you have to do is start the assay and walk away. Now, we did proof of concept validation with synthetic urine with E. coli in samples. What you see on the left side of this graph here is we see that the number of bacteria spots that we detected increased as the concentration of bacteria in the synthetic urine increased. Um, on the right, I have a graph that's showing that our limit of detection was well below the traditional limit used for screening in clinics. So we were able to detect 7,000 bacteria. Uh, Per mil. Meanwhile, in the clinic, you need to be able to detect 100,000. So, it's less than suggested that we had a promising device that could be useful for the further study. What are we doing right now? We're validating the clinical samples. We're also doing colorimetric detection because our immune assay can be adapted to do um, standard analysis where you have enzymatic deposition of colorimetric substrates. That would allow you, within a doctor's office, to have a single chip without any external power that you simply load with reagents in sample and get a visual readout of UTI. So, our market entry, this is also convenient because you've heard about this already, but babies are not the only ones that can get UTIs and can't speak. Cows can get UTIs too. And this is a less regulated market that allows us to build sustainable revenue while attracting investments and validating our products. What's our plan? So, we're going to start off by injection molding our chips. So, we have prototypes and PEMS, we'll do clinical validation, we'll enter the veterinary market, go through regulations, and hopefully get into clinical pediatric use. Our team is made up of several different scientists. I don't have time to get into details here. What I'll say is we've already been contracted to do capillary microfluidics for use in space. 
So, what is our hope? We hope that we can get to the point where an actor when Frank goes to the doctor's office with an unexplained fever, the doctor will simply get them to pee in the chair. Thank you. The, um, the cost of this system, because obviously a urine culture takes a while, but it's very cheap. So how would you think about the economics of this? Thank you. So in terms of cost, the main cost for us, we can divide it into the cartridge cost and the reagent cost. For us, we're designing devices where the feature sizes can be readily micro-machined, and then we can injection mold them. So the cost of the cartridge, including reagents, because it's also a microfluidic platform, would be less than $5 a cartridge. So within the healthcare system, in terms of reimbursing that kind of cost, we expect to make this at a comparable cost to companies like Claros or uh, who have made similar diagnoses. So we expect that the cost of the cartridge will be somewhere between a dollar and ten dollars. So could you just do the same assay with the pipette and the falcon tube? That's a very good question. Why do you do the same assay with the pipette and the falcon tube? So the assay that we set up, the reason we can actually capture bacteria so quickly, bacteria are about the equal are about one micron by two micron. And if you try and do this on a surface in the micro channel, you don't have, it diffuses very slowly. So the reason why you put the bees in there is a bit like me trying to run through an MC, uh, MC hallway in front here. You won't catch it because I'm fast. But if I'm trying to run through the chairs where you have all the chairs packed, then it's very, it's easier to catch it than that here. So we need to also do the bee packing step, which hasn't been done as easily with completely hands on fluids. And then the subsequent liquid delivery steps. And then the other thing we need the liquid delivery for is so when you do colorimetric detection, your wash steps and your blocking steps are very important to be able to get very little signal. So we can automate as many steps as you want in that process, and that makes our lives very easy. How far along are you in developing this into a business? So we, uh, I'm actually an industrial postdoc, and I work half in the lab and half in a company called Sensorial. The company was contracted uh, to make a microfluidic chip for space applications. And so we've already developed some expertise in injection molding, making stable surfaces, and storing both our antibodies in our chips. So the company already exists. We have an asset specialist, a mechanical engineer. Um, we have the scientific advisory board. So there is a company already existing. And now it's a question of developing this prototype, uh, bringing in some funding, and then developing stable remedies. So are any of your compatriots willing to leave McGill to make this work into a real company? Under the right circumstances, yes. Or maybe? Uh, under the right circumstances, yes. We know we'll have to be home. We're excited to do it, and we're looking for the right opportunity. So inertia in the medical field is just legendary. I mean, it's worse than watching grass grow. Um, practitioners just don't like to change. And as far as your examples go, I mean, the dip test works well. There's got to be some reason for them to want to change. And so, have you done any market survey asking those folks in the lab whether they would want to change? So thank you very much for your question. You're right. Medical practitioners do have inertia. I grew up in a family of doctors, and my father is actually a pediatrician, so this is very close to home. Um, what gave me, I mean, he is my father, so he's biased. However, having spent a lot of time around doctors, what I realized is for babies, children will have a lot of unexplained fevers. And so it could be one of ten different things, and you don't know. And as it stands, standard practice is you have to screen all of them with the urine culture and the blood culture. And the thing is, for a child, given the antibiotics is a big deal. So in fact, clinicians are looking for something like this. And for them, what it means is you could have ten children who have unexplained fevers. One of them has a UTI. You need to know quickly so you can rule that out and move on to other things. So in fact, our test is useful as a screening tool to rule out all those negative cases so you can actually figure out what is wrong with these children. So doctors need to know, they have to do this already. And in fact, when you mentioned that gift sticks were good, I'll, I'll put a caveat in there. Because you're looking at nitrites, if you look at reviews, there's a review in Nature uh, Urology this year, where they talked about Nature Urology reviews, where they talked about how, in fact, gift sticks are not quite specific enough. Again, because you're looking at nitrites, and nitrites, um, actually, because babies pee very, very often, <laughs> you need to detect nitrites. The nitrites, uh, your urine has to be in your bladder for several hours. So babies won't have enough pee in their blood if you to see the nitrites there. So for us, that's actually you, you said your sensitivity was 10 to the 4 per milliliter? Yep. So how does that work out for kids? Kids don't have a lot of blood. Uh, actually, is that a good enough? So this is, for us, a uh, good question. For us, it's urine. 
and so oh, you're in, you produce lots and lots of year. So maybe it's even different. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Sorry. But is that a good enough sensitivity is my question. It is. So the cutoff is set at 50,000 right now. So 7,000 that we have is good. And we have to just to improve it further. It's have lots of pee, I know that. <laughs>